Karim, uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, we have a perfect line. Um, before we dive right into um, the topic we, we want to talk about, I heard it was not very easy to get where you at the moment, and you even asked your Facebook fans to tell you where to go to either this country or the other country. Was that correct? Well, it was slightly problematic two days ago. I was sitting at the Milano airports on my way to Tunisia when the message got out that uh, Gaddafi is dead. And of course, uh, the big question was, uh, should I change and go directly to Libya or should I go to Tunisia? And for me, it was a little bit the question like, uh, do I look backward or do I look forward? I mean, for, for me, like uh, Gaddafi basically was uh, finished since he left uh, Tripolis. So politically, the end of Gaddafi is already two months ago, while uh, Tunisia is more forward-looking. We have uh, on Sunday, tomorrow, uh, the really first election after the Arab Spring, the first free, fair, and open Arab elections. Uh, so I think this was somehow more important than the death of Gaddafi, although many media saw the opposite. Karim, um, the topic of uh, today's TEDx Vienna um, discussion is the domino effect. Um, I think you are sitting right in the middle of what we could call a domino effect situation. Um, how many stones have already fallen? Well, many stones have fallen. Of course, here, like Tunisia being the first one, uh, then uh, in Egypt, and then, of course, uh, Libya. What we have is kind of a, an Arab world which is divided in three parts, basically, right now. We have an Arab world between Tunisia and the Suez Canal, uh, where, the, where the new Arab world is created. And the elections tomorrow is one important point in this. We have, of course, another part of the Arab world, like uh, Syria and uh, Yemen, where, of course, the uprising is in full swing. And we have other parts of the Arab world, like Saudi Arabia, where not much has happened yet. So, of course, this in itself has a dynamic in itself because many interests in the second parts of the Arab world, like in Saudi Arabia or also in the parts which are still in the uprising, the regimes have no interest whatsoever that this experiment in North Africa is successful. Um, you um, focus very much on revolution, but not, the, not just the big ones you will have um, a big interest in the small grains of the revolution. So the, the small parts in society that are changed and that uh, can trigger enormous effects. Um, what are those grains? Which grains can be perceived um, during such revolutions? Well, see, the interesting thing is not only so much, we always, uh, media tends to look at, for example, uh, Tahrir Square, or at the first Tunisian election. I mean, that's the focus points they have, or the death of Gaddafi. The interesting things is, are what happens left and right of that. For example, if you look in Egypt, we have a very interesting development uh, um, where uh, we have changes in the institutions, a kind of cleansing process in the institutions. For example, one uh, nice example, a story I always uh, am telling is, uh, there is a state-run hospital in Cairo. And after the fall of Gaddafi, uh, I have a friend of mine who is, uh, who is specialized in international unions law, trade union law, and he got a phone call from one of the doctors uh, of this hospital. The doctor said, you know, the problem we have, we have this director of the state hospital who was, of course, uh, put into this place by the old regime and who is incredibly corrupt, and uh, we want to get rid of him. So this uh, friend of mine is saying, like, okay, if you really want to do this, you have to organize yourself in the hospital. You have to kind of create some kind of a works council and an organization of the employees. But he said, the really important thing is not only you doctors, but you have to deal with uh, the nurses and the uh, administrative staff. So you all together have to, you have to organize yourself in, in order to get rid of the, this director. And then the doctor said, okay, hung up the phone. And uh, a few days later, he called again and said, like, you know, we have a problem. The, the doctors don't want to work together with the nurses. The nurses don't want to work together with the administra administrative staff. So he basically said, well, in this case, nobody can help you. You can just do this yourself. And then a few weeks later, he read in the newspaper that in this uh, hospital, an organization was formed. They went to the Ministry of Health and they said, we want to get rid of this director of this hospital. And uh, the health ministry said, okay, of course, no problem. We put another person in, in his place. And uh, the people from the hospital said, no, we want to 
have an election for our director in the hospital. So that is, of course, something when you see, look at like a few minutes ago, there was no organization in this hospital uh, like what you, what you would have in Europe or maybe the US, people would be organized. And then a few minutes later, they bypassed what we know in Austria. I mean, there is, for example, no elected director of a hospital, of a state hospital in Austria. So this is kind of, uh, this, this is kind of the flowers blooming in the revolutions on the side, left and right. Um, that sounds very promising even uh, for the Western world also. The Western world is, um, or parts of the Western world, uh, faces a economic um, crisis. Um, is there something we can learn from the Arab world, from those grains you were talking about? Well, I think there's many things to learn. I mean, one thing to learn is uh, a form of resistance. Right? I mean, uh, basically what the Arab Spring showed is that uh, if you are able to get the critical mass on the street and if they staying on the street, no regime in the world or no government in the world can ignore it. So you can, if you can organize enough people on the street, you can change basically everything. I think this is one of the most important messages. And the other thing is... Uh, what we also see now here is the big discussion in the Arab world about accountability. Not only political accountability, something we never had, of course, in the Arab world. I mean, Egypt, for example, was parked in a garage for 30 years, and there was not such a thing as political accountability. But also economic accountability, right? The whole issues of corruption, and uh, this is, of course, issues which economic accountability is an issue I think uh, the rest of the world can learn from this discussion here because economic accountability would be also a nice thing uh, to have in Europe or to have towards the banks or anything. I mean, that's, that's, that's something like uh, there could be an impulse coming from the Arab world towards Europe. Okay, but how, how was it and, and is it still possible to get this critical mass out on the streets, out on the places um, to show their uh, feelings, to show their protest? In the Western world, this critical mass does not show up um, so much as we were seeing that in the Arab world. What, what is still missing in the Western part? Uh, well, to start with, I mean, it's difficult to get a critical mass out in the long run also in the Arab world. Yeah? I mean, uh, so we got rid of the dictator, but at the, at, at the end, this is the starting point of a process, not the end of a process. I mean, the big question is, how will it continue here? And uh, somebody gave me a nice, ex I said, a, I give a nice example. He said, uh, he compared it to a football match. He said, you know, we had this match, this football match, and we scored a decisive goal in the second minute. This was when Mubarak, we got rid of Mubarak, when we got rid of Ben Ali, and everyone was celebrating. And we forgot that there's still 88 minutes ahead of us. And I think that's exactly what we have right now. We have 88 minutes ahead of us. And this fight in the Arab world is far from being over. I mean, we still have an issue of interests uh, within the countries which, which want to stay which wanna, as much as possible the old way, which don't want to change. And we have like others who want to change. So we are in the middle of, of, of this process. And, and, and this here is far from over. So uh, I don't know how you can say how much you can learn in Europe. We are still, the Arabs are still very busy with themselves right now. Uh, it is, uh, though, fascinating that um, there are people, um, many people in the Arab world, who know that they can lose everything, even their lives, for going out on the streets, for protesting. Um, you uh, got to know many of them. What do people think? Why do they do that? Why are they, how can they uh, evolve such braveness? You see, one of the interesting things, when I toured Europe in, in the last weeks, I was always, the question came always up, like, are the Arabs ready for democracy? Are the, is, do they have the mentality to have a democracy? So I, my answer always is like, you know, I don't think that 840 people died in Egypt or thousands of people died in Libya uh, in order not to have, I mean, to, to, to question their credibility to have a democracy, I think it's, 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 it's just, uh, I don't know. If 840 people died, they have the credibility. They died for something which uh, in Europe is just normal. That is like what, exactly what happens in Tunisia tomorrow, that people can go to free, fair, and transparent elections. Uh, something maybe you forgot in Europe, uh, the achievements. Uh, that in Europe, you have the problem that 
there are not enough people coming to the elections. I'm sure tomorrow in Tunisia you feel, will see a very, very high turnout because that's something that people fought for. And that election tomorrow is a big success story for them. One last question. What's the role of uh, social platforms uh, during those revolutions? Well, I think they played a, a very, very important role at the beginning. Uh, for me, the whole thing didn't start like last spring. We had an issue in, in Egypt uh, last summer, to, summer 2010, when uh, we had a case where a young Egyptian man named uh, Khalid Said was beaten to death on the street by two policemen in plain clothes policemen. And this kind of things normally, you know, they would have just appeared in some human rights report and a few dozen people would have read it. But in this case, the family did something uh, really important. They put the picture of this young man who's called Khalid Said, 26 year old, his old picture uh, and a picture they took uh, in the morgue uh, where you can barely recognize him because they've beaten him up so much. And they put these two pictures beside each other and put it into the internet. And that created a huge story in Egypt. And we had a Facebook page that was called We Are All Khalid Said. And hundreds, thousands of clicks. And the discussion we had in Egypt at that time was like, okay, how do you translate this I like from Facebook, for example, onto, I mean, you cannot get rid of a regime by I like on Facebook. You basically need to do this on the street. And the discussion was like, how do we do this? How do we translate this big power, virtual power on the internet onto the street? And while we're still discussing this in Egypt, the Tunisians were the first ones uh, basically showing how to do it. And, uh, and then the first evening when ben, the dictator, the Tunisian dictator Ben Ali flew out, escaped, the Egyptian youth was standing in front of the Tunisian embassy and said, uh, Mubarak, the airplane is also waiting for you. And then, of course, it was obvious that this kind of social media revolution is going to come uh, to Egypt. But I think in many ways, um, the effect of social media is maybe a little bit exaggerated. Because at the end, I think what really mobilized people was television. And uh, if I may have the time just to tell one story to tell you the power of television. Uh, there was a, a, a TV show, a talk show in Egypt in, in one private television station. A t TV sh uh, talk show that is seen by millions in Egypt. It was probably the most popular show. In the middle of the uprising in Egypt, there was a doctor um, who showed up in one of these programs. His, his name was Tarek Helmi. And he, in this talk show, told his own story. He said, uh, I'm a doctor. I'm really not interested in politics. I never cared about politics, about Mubarak. I, well, my life was between home and uh, the hospital. And then on the 25th of January, when the Egyptian revolution started, his daughter, they were sitting together, and his daughter said to him, Dad, uh, I have to go to Tahrir Square because all my friends are there. I will go there. And they were discussing it and uh, they're trying to convince her not to go, also her brother. But uh, she was stubborn and she went to go to Tahrir Square and she never came back. She stayed there. And then a few days later, his son called him and said, Dad, the same son who tried to convince his sister before not to go, he said, Dad, I have to go to Tahrir Square because some of my best friends are injured there and I want to see what happened to them. So he left too. Then a few days later, he got a phone call from his daughter from the square. She said, Dad, we need doctors here. We have so many injured people. Please come and help us. And he put together a small team and went to Tahrir Square and also stayed there. So the whole family was at Tahrir Square. And then all this, he's telling the story in this talk show. And then he's telling the story how he received a 13-year-old boy who uh, was uh, beaten up by the, by the gangs of, of Mubarak and he had like a, a big wound uh, over his head and he stitched him up and then the little boy said, uh, when he wanted to kind of finish his job, the little boy said, no, I don't have time, I have to defend our square, he said, and then he left. And then comes this moment of really Egyptian TV history where this doctor basically breaks down in this talk show and cannot continue to talk. He, tears are over, for, over his cheeks. Uh, they're trying to calm him down. And then he continues his story. He says, and I saw this 13 year old boy another time, one more time. They brought him to me again a few hours later. 
and he was shot in his head and he was dead. This program was seen by millions of people and it was on a Monday. Normally for Tahrir Square they, they mobilized for Fridays because it was easy with the Friday prayer. The following day of Monday, the Tuesday, there was more than one million people on Tahrir Square. And one of the reasons why this happened was this particular uh, talk show in the private Egyptian television station. So I think this is an important story that only, not only shows you how a whole family gets sucked in onto the Tahrir Square, originally being completely apolitical, but it also shows you the power of television at that time. Thank you, Karim. I, th I hope, um, I wish, I wish we had um, uh, a couple of more hours left to listen to you. Um, but that was very inspiring, uh, very interesting. Please give it up to uh, Karim. Thank you.